Before we leave also we, for the coffee break, which is arranged, and they cannot wait more, so we should make a group photo for the online participants. Please, all online participants, please remember that after the lecture of Professor Burgess, we will have this uh, group photo online. Please, not now, after his lecture, but okay, it, it's great that we can see you also here. Okay, Adrian, please go ahead. All right. Yeah. Um, uh, you all, can you hear me well? Yes. Perfect. Should perfect. To, good. Very good. So, um, yeah. Please warn me uh, five or ten minutes in advance. Then I then I'll uh, stop talking. I'll share my screen. I will. You should see it. Let's see if I can do a slideshow. And then I get that bloody. Sh alert again okay so i oh sorry i should have actually gone through the whole thing so just to uh, to remind you where we left off two days ago i wanted to take you through a journey uh, starting all the way at the beginning and then take you through the sort of the core design of one particular type of reactor that is actually a little bit off the mainstream Okay, so we, we learned that uh, at the beginning, everything was graphite moderated and uh, solid uh, fuel. And then we went to a liquid uh, uh, core and we are looking at the things that are important there. Now, the, the things that were important there, one of the things that's really important in any reactor, and I'll get to that, is the fact that you have these delayed neutrons, right? So, and the delayed neutrons happen, as I said before, just a quick uh, uh, review, that you have some of these fission products that decide not to decay immediately, but they decay after a while. And in, uh, in, in this case, for example, they will, uh, 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 they, will, they will decay after about one second. And there's a slight probability that it emits a neutron. Okay, so all of a sudden there's an extra neutron in the core. Now that's not just an extra neutron, that's a neutron that we actually need in order to control the reactor. Now in terms of analysis, we, um, uh, we usually split those up into six different groups according to their decay constant. So the decay constant is inversely proportional to the, to the lifetime. So things that have a very short a decay constant have a long lifetime and the other ones are very short. So this is three per second. This is one every 100 seconds. So some of these neutrons appear after a long time. And here it says how many of those you actually have. So that's a very small number. So it's only two in 10,000 neutrons that appear after 100 seconds. OK, so two out of 10. And in the maximum year, we have about two and a half out of 1,000 that appear after uh, uh, three seconds. 1 over 0.3, okay? So this is a whole distribution. And if you take all of them together, you get what is called the, the uh, uh, delayed, the total delayed neutron fraction. And that is about six per mil, a little bit more than six per mil. And that is the, uh, uh, what we call beta. Because in, in nuclear reactors, there's always this famous thing, beta. And a question you can ask uh, at a cocktail party when somebody tells you about their uh, SMR, you say, oh, what is your beta? And then they have to give you an answer. You say, oh, that's high, or oh, that's low. For example, if the core is uh, fueled with plutonium, this number would be only 0 0.002, which means that the uh, delayed neutral fraction for plutonium is smaller. And therefore, at least in principle, a plutonium-fueled reactor is somewhat harder to control than a uranium-controlled uh, reactor, fueled reactor. So we went through the equations that show that. And I like to show this equation because it is actually, for those of you who are into this kind of stuff, uh, it is easy. I mean, you know that. For those of you who are not so familiar with it, this is a, a very typical equation that determines almost anything that goes on into life. Not just the neutron population, which is shown here. This is the neutron population, that's neutrons per, uh, per square cent cubic centimeters, but also your bank account, 
that looks has exactly the same equation. Okay, if you just think about it. So where this would be the interest rate, which, you know, if you have a bank account is going up, but otherwise not so good. Uh, now, here we have what's called a point kinetics. So you see that there is no, there is no functionality of the, the uh, distribution of the flux anymore. R or X does not appear in this equation. Also, the energy doesn't appear in this equation. The only thing that appears in this equation is the number of neutrons at a given time in the whole reactor. And the idea is that unless you have a very particular upset, the flux shape, the flux of the reactor will go up and down everywhere in the same way. And you may treat it, therefore, as a point. Now, the thing that is important here is the this concentration of precursors. So those are in the... The, um, uh, the atoms that are going to do the decay and they're going to give you the delayed neutrons. And here uh, you have the equation for those pre precursors. And again, it, it looks at the change of them. And again, it consists of them being produced with a factor beta and them decaying with a factor lambda. So this is again your bank account equation, but now for, you know, for your spouse's bank account, and they are coupled. Either one of you does the groceries. So uh, and normally we would have these six different groups. So you have six equations. And then this at the bottom would be then these, these seven equations in total form the total six precursor group point kinetics equation. And to come back to the Fortran question, this stuff here, you can still handle in Fortran with a slow computer. Nowadays, we would do things that are more involved and that can do more groups. But on the other hand, why would we? This has worked for a long time, works fine. And I already told you that with the, uh, uh, with the delayed neutrons, the, any power insertion or any reactivity insertion, rho, funny way of writing rho, becomes much more benign over time than if there's no delayed neutrons. If it's no delayed neutrons, this is basically an exponential and everything goes to hell. But here, this gives you time to insert your control rods if you want to, or do other shutoff mechanisms. Now, uh, this plot comes from a nice book by Daniel Roson, and he actually, had, there's a nice statement in there which I would like to read to you because people don't often think about reactors like that. And it says that a we can consider a critical reactor to be actually a subcritical reactor in which the flux is supported by the delayed neutron source. So the reactor itself is actually prompt subcritical and it only remains critical because there's this constant firing of delayed neutrons in there. And that's very helpful for, uh, uh, for, for designing any reactor. And I will get to why that is important for for the, uh, the molten salt reactor that I'm describing here. So, but before I do that, uh, I just want to say one or two words about, about breeding. We, uh, that I'm sure you have seen that before and others have explained it to you too, but in, in many of these small modular reactor designs, there is, uh, uh, there is thorium that's being added. And thorium has this thing that when it catches a neutron, it will turn into thorium-233, of course, which then, after 20 minutes, decays to protactinium. Now, the uh, uh, 20 minutes is basically instantaneous. You, you don't care. But then the protactinium takes 27 days to decay to uranium-233. And that is the, that's the, the, the main breeding aspect here, because the uranium-233 has a fission cross-section, 49 barn, which is very similar to uranium-235. So the 233 is now all of a sudden the fuel. You start with thorium, which is just some boring material, and all of a sudden you have fuel in your reactor. So that is a, a great way to, uh, uh, to get more fuel. Now, the only problem is that the protactinium that is sitting here is also happily absorbing neutrons and then uh, decays to two other states of protactinium. So it goes to two other states of protactinium, and then decays to uranium-243, 234, which is not fissile. So 
it can go two ways, this way or that way. This way doesn't give you any good. And this way, it gives you the uranium-233. And uh, it has 27 days to do that. So we will see in the, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the diagram later on that the molten salt reactor might allow you to actually bypass this, this uh, path here and go straight that way. That is the, the thing about the, um, uh, the thorium. Now, here I should already say something else. I'm not sure how much that has come up. But one of the things about small modular reactors is that we would like to run them for an insanely long time without having to refuel. There are people who come up with designs and they say, my reactor runs 10 years and you don't need to refuel at all. Okay, now that has, that has some implications. And uh, one of the ways to actually make that happen is to spice your reactor with thorium that helps in two ways. One of the ways it helps is that it suppresses the initial reactivity because you have to have a huge reactive core when you start and you're not gonna to touch it anymore. So it's very reactive. By adding all the thorium, which is a poison, you bring down the reactivity. Plus after a while, it will start to generate its own fuel. So that's almost a story that is uh, too good to be true. And stories that are good, too good to be true usually aren't. But this is pretty, pretty good, actually. So thorium is, uh, for some reason, never made it in big uh, reactors that we currently have. But for these small modular reactors in remote locations, that will be really an, an, an important aspect. So now I just step you through the, the how uh, typical molten salt reactor will be built. And that brings us immediately to the chemical processing plant that is, uh, uh, that is connected here. And I was quite derogatory about it in my previous uh, speech, but maybe maybe I should revise that a little. But the, the, the purpose of that is to remove uh, fission products, which was one of the main design features of the original designers. But the modern design is not so much... Uh, uh, considered anymore. Uh, but the, the other thing that you could do is in when you operate with thorium, you can remove the protactinium-233 to happily let it decay to U-233 outside the core so that there are no neutrons around to be captured. And also having this, uh, this sort of tap here allows you to top up the fuel to compensate for, uh, for burnout. So then you have the... Uh, the reactor vessel here, the, uh, and then there, there's the, uh, the top of the vessel, the vessel head. Now, the, the good thing about the molten salt reactor is that it operates at low pressure. It's always good if you can operate at low pressure, that's great. It uh, reduces the chance of, uh, uh, of, of accidents, and you don't need a, a pressure vessel, and uh, every, everything is much nicer. And you can uh, vent off the fishing gases, Krypton, and as we mentioned before, the xenon, which normally poisons the reactor and makes that after you shut it down, you cannot restart immediately. In particular for candle reactors, this is a big problem. Once they are shut down, they cannot start up for 48 hours. So that has all kinds of implications. If you don't have to deal with that, that's quite nice. We have already talked about the um, uh, the emergency dump tank and the freeze plug that's there. When the temperature gets too hot, it will, the fuel will be dumped into the tanks. Still need cooling from the decay heat, of course. And uh, uh, mostly people use a passive cooling system. And this is another thing that is good about uh, small modular reactors. I don't know if that was highlighted before, but since they are small, the power is usually not that high, except of course the 300 megawatt uh, ones. But the, the ones that we are all looking at are in the 10 megawatt range, 15 megawatt range. And there, the decay heat isn't actually all that much. So that's, not, that's, that's a good thing about that. So if you have somewhere in your local community one of these little things humming along and something happens, you don't have to really worry too much about the decay heat, a little bit, not too much. And of course, we mentioned last time that you have to worry about the flooding 
because that may lead to recriticality. There's a heat exchanger. So the heat exchanger has, of course, the primary salt, which may or may not contain the, uh, the fuel, actually, but that's a different story. And then the, the, the secondary uh, uh, side may have uh, uh, either salt or some other liquid. That's totally up to the design. Now, the, the only problem is that the primary uh, circuit is partly outside of the core by definition. And that's, as I mentioned, good for letting the protactinium decay in addition to having the, uh, uh, the, 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 the this chemical thing. But it has some, it has a big problem and that's what we're going to get now. In order to look at that, we look at the ratio of the time in core over the time out of core for a given result. Now, of course, that ratio is obviously equal to the ratio of the volume the volume inside the core over the volume outside the core. So the thing is now that if you have a small R, that means that you have a lot of volume outside the core, that's good for your protactinium decay, because that means that the fuel spends a lot of time outside the core. However, it is very bad for the delayed neutrons. Okay, now if you calculate the time in core, you that's of course given by the height of the core, divided by the liquid velocity. We need those things a little later, H over U. That gives us the time in the core. And uh, the ratio of the times is, of course, R again. Okay, so these are the things to remember. This is always the, always the thing about uh, uh, designing something. There's always something that's good and something that's bad. And you have to find the middle way of, the, of it. Now, if we go and look at the, the uh, delayed neutrons, we used to have these equations here. And if you just look at one, one group, we, we now have to modify the derivative. This derivative here is a total derivative. And normally that would be good enough. But now it's not good enough anymore because it becomes a function of z. So the point kinetics is not quite point anymore. It now has a function along the z, z axis. And you have to add this term here which is sometimes called the convective term. This is just math. Okay, this is equal to that plus that. That is just mathematics. And now, so instead of having this equal to that, you have that this is equal to that. So you have to include this term here, where u is now the velocity of the salt flowing in the, in the z direction. So all of a sudden, your story becomes more complicated. All right, and the, uh, uh, what happens then is this equation here looks very difficult, but it's actually not that difficult, is that the precursor concentration at the bottom of your reactor at any given time is the precursor concentration at the top of the reactor at the previous time, where tau out is the, the time that is spent outside the uh, core, times e to the minus lambda times t out. So during this time here, during the time that the uh, precursors are outside of the core, it has a chance to decay. And that is given here. All right, so the, uh, uh, what this does is it reduces beta. Beta was our friend, because that was the one that made us uh, control the reactor very easily. And another small problem is that the, the stuff that decays outside the core, activates the circuit outside of the core. Now, how bad is this really? I'm making, I'm making a lot of hullabaloo here. I just wanted to show you, what I really want to show you is that when you start to look in detail at sometimes at the core, that is sometimes a bit more difficult, you run into things that you have to really, really think about. And that's also good because that gives you uh, opportunity for research and getting grants and students and all of that. Now, what I always find nice is how people measure these things. And here is an, uh, an, an experiment again from the, uh, uh, from the molten salt reactor in, uh, in, back in the 1960s. And what you see here is an operating reactor. Let's first, uh, let's first look at the dots here. They operate the molten salt reactor with the rod position, the control rod position down here. And it is operated without flowing fuel. 
you don't have to do that. You don't have to let the fuel flow. If you just have it, then it will just be operating. And this is done at zero power, so you don't have to extract any heat. You can react. You can run a reactor at zero power. I hope you realize that. So uh, you have a certain control rod, and then they turn on the pump. So when they turn on the pump, that means that the precursors now start to leave the core. That means that the reactivity, the neutrons, they leave with the precursors. So they have to pull out the, the rod to maintain criticality up to a certain point. And then at this point here, these uh, precursors come back into the core. They come from the bottom, they come back into the core. Okay, so well, for all of this time here, they're outside of the core here, and then they come back in. But when they come back in, some of them have decayed. So in fact, now the control rod position has to be stable at this level here in order to maintain reactivity. So without pumping, it was here, and with pumping, it was there. And this measurement actually allows you to calculate what is the effect from the, uh, uh, from the molten salt moving and what is the effect on the beta. I always find that very nice. Sometimes you have to go and look back and see it. How are things actually measured? So uh, now, then of course there are people who say, yeah, measurement is nice, but how about what does it look like in the, uh, in the calculation? So uh, Danny Lethauer from the TU Delft, they have looked at one precursor group and they have actually simulated this experiment. You see that here at t equals zero, they, the neutrons from the precursors are all nicely here in the middle of the core. It has that same sign shape and the same vessel shape. So that's why it looks like this. And then all of a sudden the fluid starts to move. So if it is a uniform motion, it just goes up like that, disappears out of the core. And then after 15 seconds, it's dark no precursors anymore, and then it comes back in. And this also gives you a, 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 a little bit of an indication that if something like this happens and you're, uh, you're sitting at this point, all of a sudden you're, you don't have delayed neutrons anymore, so everything you do acts on, uh, on prompt neutrons, which is not so healthy. But I find this a very nice picture because it really shows what's going on. And it shows the, the effect of the delayed neutrons. So one more thing before we show the, some more results. There is this thing about uh, uh, Doppler broadening. It was mentioned before that if you increase the temperature, the uh, reactivity goes down. And that occurs mostly, not mostly actually, but it occurs the, uh, most importantly in the fuel. And what happens is that a resonance in the neutron absorption, which at zero Kelvin may have this shape, and that shape is determined by quantum mechanics. And we know some stuff about it, but we really cannot calculate where the resonances are. Just have to measure them. This is what it looks like. And then just the fact that at higher temperatures, the fuel starts, the fuel atoms start to move a little bit, and therefore the energy, which is given down here, changes and assumes a wider distribution than if you have zero Kelvin. Therefore, the resonance gets wider. Now, if the resonance gets wider, that leads to higher absorption. Now, this, this is a statement that people always make, but in reality, it's actually a bit more complicated. But I don't want to go into exactly the... Uh, uh, the effect here. Just for now, just take my word for it. Doppler broadening leads to higher absorption. Higher absorption means that, you know, your, uh, uh, your reactivity goes down. A typical plot is, of course, well known here, the U238. And here you have all these resonances, you have the big ones here. And then there's so many of them, eventually you can't separate them out anymore. And it just becomes one, one fuzzy line. But all of these are resonances, and all of these widen and absorb more neutrons while uh, uh, when it gets hot. And don't forget, neutrons start out here somewhere. They start their journey. And in order, at least in a the thermal reactor, 
in order to get to where they do the fission, they have to move across all these resonances, all right? So a reactor is built to be able to do that, but then if it gets hot, it becomes harder, the reactor shuts down. So that brings us to the reactivity coefficient, which is always defined as the change in reactivity as the change over the change in uh, the variable that you're looking at. Okay, which means that the, the uh, uh, for example, for the temperature one, you would have milli K per Kelvin. Remember that rho is a number that has no dimension, it's just a number close to zero. Uh, in, in American designs, they, they uh, express rho in terms of, uh, uh, of money, in terms of cents and dollars, but uh, other people just use milli K, which is just zero, zero, one. Now there's lots of these coefficients. There's the temperature coefficient that's the most important one. And uh, the fuel one is really important because that's the one that you immediately get when there is a reactivity insertion. The first thing that heats up is the fuel. So if the fuel has a good negative coefficient, you're good. Then the moderator is also important. The moderator has a different effect. It's not because of absorption, but mostly because of the expansion of the moderator that reduces the reactivity as well. You have the density, which they are related, okay, sometimes. Coolant, moderator, and of course the poison. If you add a certain amount of poison, it will give you a certain reactivity. And this gives you a feedback. So for the, the measurements of this MSRE, this is the one that I showed you already, the reactivity loss due to circulation of delayed neutron precursors. Right? And the, uh, so what they have, uh, what they calculated is 0.22, 200 milli K. That is the, the, uh, uh, the loss due to the delayed neutron precursors. And the thing that gets me when I look at these numbers is that they, uh, they calculated 0.222. I don't know how they calculated it with the with these old, very old Fortran computers that they had, probably Fortran 4. And uh, the measured value is 0.212. Now, looking at the system that they have, this is very good for me. I, if, I, if I can show this to my regulator and say, look, we calculated this and we measured that, then they would be really happy. Note that they did the measurements for both the U-235 and U-233, and the U-233 is actually much less. I'm not quite sure why that is. That is the uh, delayed neutrons have a much lower impact there. So the, the other one that's important here is the temperature coefficients of reactivity. And they have to be careful what all of this is. So this is delta K over K uh, in per degree Fahrenheit. And again, the agreement is very good. And the number is negative. And exactly how big it is, uh, this is presumably 10 to the minus five that the minus is escaped there. But typically the, the graphite moderated reactors would have a, a negative temperature coefficient of uh, let's say 0.1 milli K or even, or even less per degree than now say Kelvin, because we, we think in Kelvin. And that's great. So that means that if something bad happens to the reactor, you get a reactivity insertion, the reactor gets hot, reactivity goes down, the reactor cools down again. But there's a catch here. There's a catch. And it's another thing if you want to make people nervous, you can ask them, uh, or you have to consider what happens so your reactor, you have a nice reactor like this one, which is humming along at let's say 900 Kelvin, pumping out uh, power, has a very nice, very large negative uh, temperature coefficient. And then in the evening, you want to shut it down because you want to go home and you shut it down. If you shut it down, it cools off. What happens if it cools off? Well, if it cools off, all of a sudden, that temperature coefficient 
is going to insert an enormous amount of reactivity in your uh, in your system. And then if it goes down to let's say uh, room temperature at some point, the 20 degrees, then you may have inserted 100 millik just like that by the temperature coefficient. So what that what that means is that when you shut it down, you have to have shut down, shut down devices that are strong enough to support that. And that is not obvious, okay? And if you don't do that, or if you make a mistake with that, you get a reactor that you shut down, then when it cools off completely, it starts up by itself again. So again, this is something that I want to show you that this in a reactor core, there are sometimes things that you that you have to think about. Okay, and then of course these these uh, the okay now pay attention these shut off rods here. Uh, typically, you want them to be as close in the core as possible, so they would stick sort of in the upper reflector, and then uh, if they stick in the upper reflector, that's of course uh, not so nice because they would absorb neutrons there. So what you do is at the bottom of these shut off uh, rods. You put uh, you put graphite, so that when the shuttle rods are in the upper reflector, you you uh, they don't disturb, and then when they fall into the core, they start to get active. I'm pausing here for a moment to see if there is a reaction from anyone in the chat. No, it's not. It's not for me. Okay. Uh, Adrian, you asked me to remind you, you have like seven minutes, including questions. Oh God. <laughs> All right, so then I'll, 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 I won't uh, do this. So when you do what I just said, which is what you would like to do if you, uh, uh, if you design a reactor, you're actually building the, uh, an RBMK and this uh, would lead to an accident that happened in Chernobyl. So don't do that, okay? Um, all right, let me go then to, I'll skip the how you simulate them. I just want to say the final words there. You have the uh, slides. So there is the, uh, the modern designs now. There's a whole bunch of these. And you can click on each of them and you get nice pictures of them. A lot of them have uh, thorium in them. The, um, uh, the Chinese ones actually, I see that they're not listed here. They, they are operating with thorium already. Another list of them. And the final thing I want to say, uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff, they're all there, is just the situation in Canada. Akira, uh, Professor, um, uh, yeah, Akira already mentioned that the, uh, the Canadian licensing regime is different. In Canada, what we want to do, the regulator leaves it up to the vendor to decide, to tell, to convince them that the reactor is safe. That's why people like uh, Canada as a, as a regulator, because if you have a, a design, you can just run it by the Canadian uh, regulator first to see what they think about it. Now, we do actually go and build small modular reactors. McMaster University, where I am from, we are going to build, an, with Ultra Safe Nuclear Corporation and Global First Power, we are going to build a micro modular reactor in our campus to serve, to serve the, uh, the local grid and also to provide heat to the campus. And this is actually going to happen. Okay, so this is, they're all very gung ho about that. It's going to... Now my story comes back to the history. This design here is a pretty old and proven design. Graphite, triso particles, helium cooled, 15 megawatt thermal. Also, We cannot hear, we lost your voice, Adrian. Looks like you are muted. Adrian. We, we don't, I think you disconnected. If 
connected to please connect again and okay let's use this pause oh Yeah, okay. L l let's wait until he recovers, but and use this opportunity to make a group photo online of online participants. So I will ask the all online participants to switch.